Good afternoon. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. Together with my colleague, Rachel Day Floor, director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all our library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this special 46th Penn Hemingway Award for debut novel celebration. Thank you for joining us this afternoon virtually to celebrate the work of the 2022 winners and honorees. I would like to acknowledge all those who make this event possible, including the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR, and the generous supporters who help sustain the Hemingway Collection and its programs, especially the Hemingway Family, Hemingway Limited, and our Friends of the Hemingway Collection members. We're very pleased to be collaborating and co-presenting this afternoon's celebration in conjunction with the International Hemingway Foundation and Society. We are grateful as always to the Hemingway family for their continued support of our Hemingway programs, to Penn America for their work administering the award and to the distinguished judges for the 2022 awards who have joined us for today's event. We're thrilled to have members of the Hemingway family joining us here virtually and watching all online. As always, we send our greetings and best wishes to Ernest Hemingway's son, Patrick, and his wife, Carol. Patrick and Carol have long been the vanguard of support for the Ernest Hemingway collection that resides here in the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. We are honored to be the world's largest repository for the writer's personal papers and photographs. For decades, Patrick's annual readings from his father's works at the Penn Hemingway ceremony were a real pleasure for us here at the library. In recent years, Dr. Sean Hemingway, the writer's grandson, has taken up this mantle. He and his wife, Dr. Colette Hemingway, co-chair the Hemingway Council, which raises funds for and awareness of the collection. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Hemingway. Dr. Hemingway is the John A. and Carol O. Moran Curator in charge of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. He is a renowned archeologist with a specialty in Greek and Roman bronzes and has excavated prehistoric, classical and Roman sites in Greece and Spain. He received his doctorate from Bryn Mawr College, studied as a Fulbright scholar at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens and has been a visiting curator at the American Academy in Rome. He is the author of numerous scholarly publications, including The Horse and Jockey from Artemision, a bronze equestrian monument of the Hellenistic period and of the novel, The Tomb of Alexander. He is also editor of the Hemingway Library editions of Ernest Hemingway's works. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Hemingway to our virtual stage. Thank you so much, Alan. It is a real pleasure to be here with you all today to celebrate literature and this year's winner and finalists of the Hemingway Penn Award. There is a long tradition of giving Ernest Hemingway a voice at this event, and it is my honor to read two brief sections from his writing. The first reading is in tribute to the people of Ukraine who have, brought, who have been brought into and are now valiantly fighting a war in their own country. My grandfather witnessed many of the major wars of the 20th century. He came to know war well and to hate it. When World War II finally came to an end with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Hemingway wrote down his thoughts on the advent of atomic warfare, which were published in 1946 as the foreword to a book entitled A Treasury of the Free World. I would like to read you a passage from that book now. We have waged war in the most ferocious and ruthless way that it has ever been waged. We waged it against fierce and ruthless enemies that it was necessary to destroy. Now we have destroyed one of our enemies and forced the capitulation of the other. For the moment, we are the strongest power in the world. It is very important that we do not become the most hated. We need to understand to study and understand basic problems of our world as they were before Hiroshima, to be able to continue intelligently to discover how some of them have changed and how they can be settled justly, 
now that a new weapon has become a property a part of the world. We must study them more carefully than ever now and remember that no weapon has ever settled a moral problem. It can impose a solution, but it cannot guarantee it to be a just one. An aggressive war is the great crime against everything good in the world. A defensive war, which must necessarily turn to aggressive at the earliest moment, is the necessary great counter crime. But never think that war, no matter how necessary nor how justified, is not a crime. Ask the infantry and the dead. The second passage that I would like to read to you is quite different and is in tribute to this year's winner, Tori Peters, and her book, Detransition Baby. It is the first part of a short story that my grandfather wrote in 1931 called The Sea Change. It is a story about two lovers, a man and a woman, and the woman's infidelity with another woman, which causes the man to think of having sex with another man to get back at his lover. The Sea Change. All right, said the man, what about it? No, said the girl, I can't. You mean you won't? I can't, said the girl. That's all that I mean. You mean that you won't? All right, said the girl. You have it your own way. I don't have it my own way. I wish to God that I did. You did for a long time, the girl said. It was early and there was no one in the cafe except the barman and these two who sat together at a table in the corner. It was the end of the summer and they were both tanned so that they looked out of place in Paris. The girl wore a tweed suit. Her skin was a smooth golden brown. Her blonde hair was cut short and grew beautifully away from her forehead. The man looked at her. I'll kill her, he said. Please don't, the girl said. She had very fine hands and the man looked at them. They were slim and brown and very beautiful. I will, I swear to God I will. It won't make you happy. Couldn't you have gotten into something else? Couldn't you have gotten into some other jam? It seems not, the girl said. What are you gonna do about it? I told you. No, I mean, really. I don't know, he said. She looked at him and put out her hand. Poor old Phil, she said. He looked at her hands, but he did not touch her hand with his. No thanks, he said. It doesn't do any good to say I'm sorry? No. Nor to tell you how it is? I'd rather not hear. I love you very much. Yes, this proves it. I'm sorry, she said, if you don't understand. I understand, that's the trouble, I understand. You do, she said. That makes it worse, of course. Sure, he said, looking at her. I'll understand all the time, all day and all night, especially at night, I'll understand. You don't have to worry about that. I'm sorry, she said. If it was a man, don't say that. It wouldn't be a man. You know that. Don't you trust me? That's funny, he said. Trust you. That's really funny. I'm sorry, she said. That's all I seem to say. But when we do understand each other, there's no use to pretend we don't. No, he said, I suppose not. I'll come back if you want me. No, I don't want you. Then they did not say anything for a while. You don't believe I love you, do you? The girl asked. Let's not talk rot, the man said. Don't you really believe I love you? Why don't you prove it? You didn't used to be that way. You never asked me to prove anything. That isn't polite. You're a funny girl. You're not. You're a fine man and it breaks my heart to go off and leave you. You have to, of course. Yes, she said. I have to and you know it. Thank you. I'd like to pass the podium now to Dr. Carl Eby, president of the International Hemingway Foundation and Society. Great. Carl. Thank you so much for the powerful and really timely very timely reading, Sean. I really appreciate that. And I've always loved that story, The Sea Change. Um, good afternoon. Uh, as, as Sean said, I'm Carl Eby. I'm president of the Ernest Hemingway Foundation and Society. 
The Hemingway Foundation was established in 1965 by Mary Hemingway, uh, Ernest's widow, for the purpose of awakening, sustaining interest in, promoting, fostering, stimulating, supporting, improving, and developing literature. The Foundation and Society is proud to promote Hemingway scholarship and new voices in contemporary fiction. As part of that mission, I'm honored to be here to celebrate the Penn Hemingway Award, which each year honors a debut novel of exceptional merit by an American author. For their extraordinary work, I'm delighted to congratulate this year's winner, Tori Peters, and this year's finalists, Avni Doshi, Carolyn Farrell, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, and Kirsten Valdez Quaid. I'm grateful also for the opportunity to thank the Hemingway family, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, uh, the UCross Foundation, and PEN America for everything they do to support this award, Hemingway's legacy in American literature. I wanna thank Terry Tempest Williams for her beautiful work, I've long been a fan, and for agreeing to join us as today's keynote speaker. And many thanks to all of you, our audience, for joining us today. Finally, I want to extend our deepest thanks to this year's award judges, Zane Jukadar, uh, Thea Abrecht, and Daniel Torde. Um, distinguished writers all, they generously dedicated their time and energy to the enormous task of reading and considering the past year's many incredible and diverse debut novels. Thank you so much for this work. And with that, let me turn it over to Zane uh, Jukadar uh, to begin honoring uh, this year's finalists. Over to you, Zane. Great, thank you so much, Carl. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, I, I'm Zane Jukadar. Uh, I'm the author of the novels The 30 Names of Night and Map of Salt and Stars, and I was one of the judges this year. Um, and I think I can speak for all of us um, on the judging panel when I say that we loved all of these books that we're celebrating. It was really a privilege to read all of these books, and it's it's a privilege to get to celebrate all the finalists' work tonight, um, and and the winner, Tori Peters. Um, it was truly an honor to have the chance to to be a judge, and I'm so grateful to Pen America to have had the chance to read and elevate these really incredible books and authors. Um, so thank you for celebrating with us tonight. So so I'm going to start out by introducing Avni Doshi, who's the author of Burnt Sugar. Uh, so the novel Burnt Sugar is narrated by a daughter tasked with caring for an ailing mother who failed to care for her when she was younger. Um, and as the novel goes on, and Doshi's sort of obsessive, really searing narrator starts to prove unreliable, the reader begins to question who betrayed whom and whether the truth between these two women is a mercy or a weapon. Um, spare, sharp, and unflinching, Burnt Sugar not only asks questions about who gets labeled a bad mother or a selfish one, but also about the nature of motherhood itself and its costs and what mothers and daughters owe each other. Um, unfortunately, Avni Doshi couldn't be here with us tonight, but we do have a video reading to share, so I'll, I'll pass it over to that video now. Thank you. In the lead up to the wedding, Philip's mother gave her astrologer my date and time of birth to ensure my stars aligned with her sons. The truth is my mother lost my birth certificate years ago during the time we were homeless. And because looking into the official birth record would have been a hassle, we invented something that seemed like a fair approximation. I know it was dark, Ma said. That narrows it down to early in the morning or late at night, I replied. We told Lilip's mother I was born at 8.23 in the evening, 2023 20, hours in military time, deciding on the 23 because anything that ended in zero or five might seem made up. Four months before the wedding, Philip's mother called me at home. The pundit spoke to me, she said. He's very concerned. A birth chart had been made for me, a chart to represent the sky at the moment I was born. Mungal, the red planet, had been found to be in a dangerous aspect, placed squarely in the house of marriage. You're a Munglik. That's what they call people like you, she said. The line was fuzzy and I missed the rest of the accusation. 
She explained that if I married her son, my fiery energies could kill him. I remained silent for a while, wondering if this was their way out. Had Dilip asked his mother to call and break our engagement? I could hear her breathing, opening and closing her moist lips close to the receiver. Maybe she expected an apology. I didn't offer one. Don't worry, she said, when the length of the silence had passed into uncomfortable. The pundit has a cure. The next day, a pundit appeared at our door. He was not my mother-in-law's priest, but a local ambassador chosen to set things right. Who is this? Ma said, as we watched him place a woven mat on the floor of the flat. Too much of the planet Mars, the pundit said. It's bad for her husband. Superstitious nonsense. Ma pulled a stick of incense from his hand and began waving it around his head. The man continued his work unperturbed. He arranged fruit in steel trays, then flowers, milk. There were saris and embroidered red cloth. He seated himself in front of an earthen pot and lit a fire with ghee, wood chips, and newspaper. The torpor of the summer was upon us and the inside of the flat felt like a pressure cooker. I sneezed and a ball of dark snot landed in my palm, thick and bloody like a tumor. I was sure this was a bad omen and wiped it on the skin under my tunic. The pundit layered red and orange fabrics on top of several wood blocks. He moved his hands quickly, making swastikas out of uncooked grains of rice, placing whole beetle nuts here and there to represent the planets in the cosmos, anointing them with some benediction that escaped me. I sat down in front of four bronze idols. They were no more, they were no more than 10 centimeters tall. Today, this is your husband, the pundit said. I looked at the gods. Their faces were mostly the same, except for Ganesh, whose tusk was curved into a smile. What, all? No, only this one, Vishnu, the pundit smiled. He will absorb your bad energies by marrying you first, so your next husband won't have to suffer. Vishnu looked delicate, with an aquiline nose and a shortened chin. Do I have to do this? I asked the holy man. Can't we just tell everyone I did it? The pundit didn't answer. The ceremony was long, longer than my wedding to Dilip would be a few months later and full of chanting. I circled the fire, holding the small deity in my arms, watching his motionless face. A simple Mangal Sutra was placed around my neck and a crimson line of Sindur in my parting to symbolize that I was a married woman. After the ceremony, the necklace was ripped off and the red paste smeared across my forehead. Married and divorced, the pundit said. I looked in the mirror. There was an imprint that the hook of the necklace had left on my skin. My face was speckled with red. It was a violent business. The priest shook my hand. Then he asked for a donation and a cup of tea. Hi, I'm Daniel Torday. Uh, I am the director of career writing at Vermont College, where I'm very edified to learn Dr. Hemingway received a degree. Um, also the author of uh, the novels, The Last Flight of Poxel West and Boomer One. Um, it was a really amazing opportunity to get to judge these awards. Uh, I wanted to say first what a just pure pleasure it was to work with Zane and with uh, Tay Obrecht, who were amazing judges. Um, I think it's just worth framing for a moment to say that we went through hundreds of debut novels, all of which were uh, so impressive. The um, Just winnowing them down to the 10 that were on the long list actually excluded for, for all three of us some of our favorite books of the year. Um, so the state of fiction is strong, and we're lucky to have been able to, to listen through. So the, the, five, the five writers we're listening to today are uh, truly, truly exemplary writers. Um, Carol Farrell's Dear Miss Metropolitan, which I want to uh, give absolute proper props from the start, strikes me as uh, somehow the child of both James Joyce's Ulysses and the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. It presents uh, a group of girls who have been abducted and, uh, and traumatized in uh, the outer boroughs, but it does so in a way that literally 
feels at times almost as if we're reading an update of Ulysses or or um or further back uh, Tristram Shandy. It's also the um a, a book that has been a finalist for both the Penn Hemingway and Penn Faulkner. So Carolyn will choose between which of those two great writers she wants to be uh, compared to most. Um, it presents a story both through narratives from multiple voices, uh, jumping out to multimedia. There are narratives told through a nursing tests, uh, jumps ahead decades into the future to the novelist Dan Sean's classroom of Oberlin. It makes moves that throughout the entirety of the book um, feel like they should not be able to, to, to swim. Um, while reading all 500 pages of it, I just kept on feeling like um, we were Wiley Coyote over the cliff and I kept waiting for it to drop and it never did to the last page. Um, it's a total honor to be able to celebrate Dear Miss Metropolitan here. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for that uh, great introduction. Um, I just again wanted to thank um, uh, the Penn uh, Hemingway Foundation. I'd love to thank the International Hemingway Foundation and Society. Um, I'd love to uh, uh, thank all of the people who made this event possible, including Liz Murphy. Um, I'd love to thank uh, my fellow finalists. Uh, I'd love to congratulate uh, Tori Peters. Um, and I'd love to thank the judges for uh, reading all of these books and uh, choosing ours. Uh, what an honor. Um, it's humbling, it's exciting, and I'm just thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much for organizing this event. I'm going to read a little bit um, from the uh, section entitled uh, uh, Dear Miss Metropolitan. And I think all you need to know is that uh, Miss Metropolitan is a newspaper woman or fancies herself to be a newspaper woman. She writes for a local Queen's newspaper. She does the advice column, but she has much higher uh, aspirations. Uh, and she is witnessing um, the house across the street being opened and uh, three girls being let out who have apparently been held in captivity. So she is witnessing with the rest of the neighborhood what is happening. According to Miss Metropolitan, watching the police lead that vicious rogue away was a sight never to be forgotten in the history of humankind. What she didn't mention in the article, however, was the way her heart had raced as she watched them handcuff the man formerly known as Ernst, Ernest, or Ernesto. She didn't mention the way her throat collapsed as the police spotlight shone on the boarded windows of his house where he'd kept the girls. She also failed to note that after the last ambulance pulled away, she believed she might be experiencing another attack of heart arrhythmia, a condition which she told no one about, uh, a, a, I'm sorry, a condition about which she told no one in the office. Every day, Miss Metropolitan felt certain she would collapse in the street and none of her neighbors would notice. Dying alone had always been something of a bad taste in her mouth. None of the above was reported in the article Matilda Maron submitted in person to the Queen's Metropolitan on December 14, 2007. She wanted to stick to the facts as they taught her in newspaper school back in the day, but just the air alone and the frenetic nighttime of the victim girls sparked within her the need to describe, to unmask, to fully comprehend when she arrived at the newsroom the next morning, the editor took the pages from Miss Metropolitan's hands, typewritten, double-spaced, marked up and down with whiteout and red pen, and the editor thanked her. Last night was indeed a bad night, the editor said. Matilda Moran flopped into an office chair, placed a hand on her chest. Yes, it was a bad night, she said. It saved lives. She drifted, remembering that wool dark sky laced with the fragrance of snow. She had just closed her bedroom window and positioned herself at the vanity with a ream of stationery and the old blue lamy she used for formal letters. Dear Myrtle, she wrote her sister, I know you are a thief. That Rosenthal did not just walk away on its own. Miss Maddie, the editor said, are you all right? She begins to write more in her memory, but suddenly there is a commotion outside. Matilda pushes the letter away, floats to the front door of her small brick ranch, once belonging to daddy who'd inherited it at my, poor mommy's death 
And there it is, sirens shrieking, ambulances sparking the street. She feels a shudder in the sidewalk trees. There are people gathering beyond her yard, stepping onto the porch steps. Matilda feels the cold go right through her bed jacket. One of her oldest neighbor friends, Frida Bent, is dangling not 20 feet away at the chain link friend, a fence. Frida in this cold? Wasn't it near 10 o'clock? Didn't Frida always sit in front of law and order about this time? Matilda wants to ask her friend what's happening, but she doesn't. She is a newspaper woman, for heaven's sake, and her job is to find out the answers on her own. The street is pure mayhem, flashing lights and crowds and voices. As she wraps her bed jacket tightly around her chest, it occurs to Matilda that she must be at the scene of a crime. Frida Ben turns towards Matilda and shouts, can you believe this shit? A few feet over, a policeman, as puny as the day is short, Matilda notes, swivels on his heel and glares at Frida. How can he hear her above the, how he can hear her above the din is unclear. Matilda cries out, my friend don't mean nothing, officer, pay her no mind. But the puny officer says nothing. His eyes are back across the street. Everyone's eyes are across the street. Matilda crimps down the broken cement steps and toward the chain link fence, separating her property from the sidewalk. The street and the house where all the turmoil is happening, a line of EMTs hover near the front door, talking amongst themselves. Police pace up and down and sideways. Matilda's bed jacket has fallen from her shoulders, but she aches too much to bend down for it. In another time, a gentleman would have offered her his coat as an act of gallantry. Chivalry is dead, she thinks, or at least on a CPAP machine, wheezing out its last dogged breaths. Where are those days, she wonders, huffing toward the puny policeman. She feels old as the hills, but has not forgotten her mission. Good evening, officer. Might you be so kind as to tell me what is going on? Stay back, both of you, the puny cop says brusquely. One of his hands goes to his gun, the other to his radio. Matilda and Frida look at each other. Wouldn't it be nice, Matilda wants to ask, if people were just went the extra mile to be kind? It doesn't take a lot to be kind. A smile is a frown turned upside down. She knows Frida doesn't share such thoughts. Why bother asking? This neighbor woman, a confidant of 20 years, can be crude in situations requiring tact and a watchful eye. In situations like these, a woman like Frida Bent has no real purpose. Wake up, Miss Maddie. Don't you hear me? Charlie, call 911. Call 911. But still, Frida grabs Maddie's hand and the two women move toward the crowd, a bulwark of nightgown, pajama bottom, hair curled persons flapping their arms in the cold. The two women get no farther than the curb of the sidewalk. Rubberneckers, Matilda notes. What are they doing on my turf? Gawkers, pure and simple. They must have come a long way to witness this spectacle. Jamaica Avenue, Farmers Boulevard, the Long Island Expressway, all the number streets. They should have stayed in their own backyard, goddamn oglers. Lord have mercy on this shit, Frida says. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Wow, that book. Oh, um, so next, I'd like to say a few words about Honoré Fanon Jeffers and the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, which also won the Fiction Prize from the National Book Critics Circle this year. Um, love songs is incredibly sweeping in scope um, for those who aren't familiar. And that's both in terms of the cast of characters and also the hundreds of years of history that it encompasses. Um, the novel is an intergenerational story of a Black family in the American South that reveals through the eyes of a black girl growing up and coming of age in central Georgia, the story of race and racism in America and the present day legacies of slavery, the genocide of indigenous peoples, the civil rights movement, and so much more. It's ambitious and lyrical. And through, through everything, Love Song centers black women and girls singing their struggles and triumphs in the epic register of the saga and using the form itself to allow them to take up the space that their stories deserve. Unfortunately, Honorary Jeffers couldn't be with us tonight and, and wasn't able to share a video with us, but, um, but I can just say how deeply this book touched me and, um, and what a feat it is. And it's even more impressive given that it's a debut novel um, with such an expansive vision and scope. 
Um, and as an aside, it's, it's it was also a feat for us to to read a book of more than uh, 800 pages <laughs> and be unable to put it down, especially given how many novels the judges read. So I think I can speak for all of us when I say um, just how much we love this book, how excited we are to celebrate Honoré Jeffers and um, and to celebrate this really amazing work. Um, so now I'll pass it back to to Dan. Thank you. Uh... I get the opportunity to talk about Kirsten Valdez Caves, The Five Wounds, a novel I have been anticipating actually for, for almost a decade. Um, when Kirsten's first book, uh, Night at the Fiestas, came out, it announced her as impressive literary voice as we have. Um, I think very much in the spirit of, of Ernest Hemingway, the fact that Kirsten established herself as such, such an important voice in the short story and then moved to the novel feels very apt for, for the moment that we have here. I've actually been teaching a short story version of this novel, also called The Five Wounds, which appeared in The New Yorker back in 2012 for a decade, um, which is to say that it was both exciting to see The Five Wounds become an amazing full-fledged 400 page novel, but also um, there, I had some trepidation um, in, in how one might take that story and, and expand it, and Kirsten did it with flair. Uh, it tells us, the book tells the story of, um, uh, 16 year old girl Angel and her father Jesus in um, Las Spanish, New Mexico. It has the benefit of both being an amazing literary novel full of beautiful sentences and character observation, um, but also presenting to us a community in New Mexico about which Kirsten exclusively writes. All of her stories were set in New Mexico, um, but presenting to us a, a kind of Gnostic uh, Catholic sect who celebrate um, the um, crucifixion through actually uh, going through and doing it themselves. So I'm presenting that world, presenting it with such beautiful literary flair. Uh, we are very lucky to have this book and I will move along as we get to hear Kirsten read from it. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be a part of this celebration. I'm going to read a brief section from my novel, The Five Wounds. Um, this is in Angel's point of view. She is 16 years old and pregnant, and the scene takes place at Smart Starts, which is the teen parenting program she attends with other girls her age. Angel pinches the underside of her chin as she thinks. It's journaling time, and Brianna has told them to make a list of things they each need to make their own and their baby's lives better. The first few are easy. One, GED or high school diploma and college degree. Two, a support system. Three, a car. Four, a driver's license. Five, a job. Here, Angel is stumped. If she got a job, who would take care of the baby? So she adds six, free babysitter, a good one. But there is no such thing, not really. Not unless your mom or grandma doesn't work. Even Angel knows that. Briefly, she considers her father, then dismisses the thought. Christy and Trinity are whispering. They are best friends and knew each other from before Smart starts. We got pregnant like the same month, they're always telling people, which is either a crazy fluke or an organizational feat. Both possibilities depress Angel. Who'd like to share, asks Brianna. Today she wears her clunky sandals and a shapeless maroon sweater dress that is too heavy for outside. Jen raises her hand, tucking her silky mousy hair behind her large white ear, preparing herself for the stage. An education, Jen smiles, anticipating Brianna's praise. A cross dangles from her neck, and in the lobes of those stuck out ears, diamond studs glint. Even though Angel knows they probably aren't real, knows she could get a pair herself at the mall, she's still jealous. On her left hand, Jen wears a promise ring with a dinky little amethyst. It's my birthstone, she said, as if none of the rest of them were born in months with birthstones. She's going to marry her boyfriend, whom she met at church and who picks her up every afternoon when Smart Starts lets out. Angel's stomach turns whenever she thinks of her own child's father, of Ryan Johnson, the way in geometry he always sat in the front row, grimacing up at the board. He always raised his hand to answer questions, but was only correct about 50% of the time. It seemed crazy to Angel to keep putting yourself out there like that. But the next time Mrs. Esposito asked a question, there he was, long skinny arms swinging in the air. 
Hey, he told her breathlessly once in the hall after class. I thought of a name for you, a math name. For weeks he called her Angle, or sometimes delighting himself still further, obtuse Angle. He was so persistent she felt embarrassed for him, which, along with the tequila shots, explains why she slept with him. Her embarrassment also explains, perhaps, why she hasn't told him the baby is his. Thank you. Now I have the honor of introducing the winner of this year's award, Tori Peters for Detransition Baby, um, which I, is a book that I loved, um, all of us loved, of course, and um, and uh, before I read the the blurb that we have prepared, um, you know, I just want to say uh, that um, that just how amazing this book is, and also that I had been, you know, I had been following um, Tori Peters' um, novellas previously and other writings, and it's just such a it's so awesome that we get to um, honor her and celebrate her. Um, and so, um, just going to read a little bit about this book to introduce her. Um, so, Tori Peters' Detransition Baby, with its sharp wit devastating clarity and keenly observed characters is exceptional not only for its fluid, intelligent prose, but also for the way the novel challenges dominant narratives of time and of gender that flatten and erase the rich complexity of the lives of both cis and trans people. There's really an elation and honesty and a verve to Peter's voice that sounds unlike any prose in recent memory for us. Um, a unique energy which keeps the narrative moving as she threads in and out of the consciousness of these unforgettable characters. Detransition Baby is a masterful portrait of an unlikely family navigating a world that so often forecloses trans futures. Um, a story of three characters puzzling out how to love each other with grace, tenderness, and when all else fails, with humor. So thank you so much, Tori, and over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so honored uh, to be included with the other finalists um, and, and to be chosen by these judges. I apologize for not having video uh, today. I'm traveling. Um, but I thought I would, um, in honor of Hemingway, I thought I'd read a section that is uh, elephant related, elephants uh, both metaphorically and uh, 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 literally. And uh, so I'll, I'll just begin. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a, between Ames and Katrina. Uh, Ames is a, a trans woman who detransitioned. Katrina gave him a once over. So you got sick of being trans? I, I got sick of living as trans, Ames says. I got to the point where I thought I didn't need to put up with the bullshit of gender in order to satisfy my sense of self. I am trans, but I don't need to do trans. Ames could run through this routine without even thinking about it. How many times had he tried to explain he's detransitioned to other trans women, tried to assuage the sense of betrayal that their wariness obviously communicated? In Ames's formulation, trans women knew what trans women were. They knew how to be, but they didn't know how to do. All the intra-trans fights online, all the arguments with cis people, all of it was just to define what it meant to be a trans woman, to say what she was. But when, you, but when you're a trans woman, there's almost nothing out there on how to actually live. In his last year of living as a woman, the year in which Ames stopped being so angry with how cis people treated trans women, and uh, uh, trying each other. He came up with a private, not particularly catchy term for trans women of his cohort, the ones who began to transition in the early 2010s. He called them juvenile elephants. Nowadays, Ames didn't really feel that he had the same luck. But if you had asked him that year too, Park rangers a whale stood down and shot a gang of three juvenile elephants that had made a sport of chasing, raping, and killing rhinoceroses. The elephant gang raped and murdered 63 rhinos before the park rangers caught up with them. In Sierra Leone, another herd of elephants raised a village of 300, flattening the mud and wattle homes and killing an elderly woman who attempted to chase them away. A young elephant in that pack, barely full grown, pinned the woman to the ground with a knee and slowly gored his tusk through her chest with malicious precision. 
Towards the end of the civil war in Northern Uganda, Karamajong villagers began to leave out poison laced elephant snacks to retaliate against raids by the legally protected elephants of nearby Kadapo Park, who smashed the homes in the adjacent villages to get drunk on the fermenting fruit that Karamajong used to brew wine. Perhaps the villagers needn't have bothered. Since the mid 90s, 90% 90 of male elephant deaths in South African game parks could be attributed to murder by other roving gangs of pachydermicidal elephants, a 1500% increase in elephant on elephant violence over previous decades. Ames learned all this in an essay titled Elephant Breakdown, published in the science journal Nature, in which a group of leading elephant behavioralists argued that the abnormal quality and frequency of elephant attacks and violence could no longer be understood through the long-standing reasoning that suggested high levels of testosterone in young males or competition for scarce, scant land and resources. No, the behavioralist argued, the younger generation of elephants suffered from a form of chronic stress, a species-wide trauma that has led to a total and ongoing breakdown of elephant culture. The cause is simple. Throughout their long history, elephants have lived in intricately ordered social structures. Young elephants learn their place in healthy behavior in concentric societal rings of caregivers, birth mother, aunt, grandmothers, friends, relationships that might last a lifetime, 70 years or more. Unless orphaned, young elephants stay within 15 feet of their mothers for the first eight years of their lives. When an elephant dies, her family members grieve and ritually mourn. The bereaved conduct week-long vigils by the body, covering it with brush and rubbing their trunks along the teeth of the lower jaw of the carcass, a gesture of greeting among live elephants. This millennial generation of elephants is an orphan generation. In the last few decades, humans have murdered, mutilated, or displaced an entire generation of older elephants who might have bestowed upon this generation the familial, societal, and emotional skills required to handle one's individual 15,000 pounds of muscle and bone through which courses intolerable memories of pain, trauma, and grief. When the park rangers in South Africa finally caught and shot the three elephants responsible for the rhino assaults in the park, researchers examined the corpses and determined that all three perpetrators had been transported by wardens to the game reserve some years earlier. All three had been adolescent males, originally found as juveniles chained to the bodies of their dead and dying relatives, a practice that poachers commonly employ so the park rangers can find and handle the young ones, much as fishermen toss back young fish. Once transported to a new locale, a savanna free of any elders, the three child traumatized elephants found each other, bonded in mutual sorrow and grief, and wreaked their vengeance on each other in the world. Ames, Having explained the condition of juvenile elephants, drew this metaphor. Trans women are juvenile elephants. We are much stronger and more powerful than we understand. We are 15,000 pounds of muscle and bone forged from rage and trauma, armed with ivory spears and faces unique in nature, living in grasslands where any one of, of the ubiquitous humans may or may not be a poacher. With our strength, we can destroy, destroy each other with ease. But we are a lost generation. We have no elders, no stable groups, no one to teach us to countenance pain, no matriarchs to tell the young girls to knock it off or show off their own long lives lived happily and well. Those older generations of trans women died of HIV, poverty, suicide, repression, or disappeared to pathologize medicalization and stealth lives. And that's if they were lucky enough to be white. They left behind only scattered, exhausted voices to tell the angry young when and how the pain might end, to tell us what will be lost when we lash out with our considerable strength or use the fragile shards of what remain of our social networks to ostracize, punish, and retaliate against those who behave in a traumatized manner. And so we have become what we have seen. How could we know not to? Have you seen many orphans, juvenile elephants behaving otherwise? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for the honor of this. Uh, and again, I apologize for not being able to be on video, but I'm, if you could see my face, it is one of, 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 of grinning and, and being incredibly honored.
Thank you so much, Tori, for that incredible selection, for your powerful perceptions, your words, and your work. Thank you and congratulations, and congratulations to all of this year's finalists. My name is Hillary Justice. I'm the Hemingway Scholar in Residence at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Foundation. And on behalf of all my colleagues at the JFK Library and in the Ernest Hemingway Foundation and Society, it's an especial privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, Terry Tempest Williams. In her keynote address to the seventh International Hemingway Conference in Sun Valley, Ms. Williams wondered whether perhaps for Hemingway, the pain of living begins when the pen is picked up. She continued, this is the terror of reflection that a writer cannot escape if they're committed to the truth, but the pain of not writing is worse. Ms. Williams has been called a citizen writer, a writer who speaks and speaks out eloquently on behalf of an ethical stance toward life. A naturalist and fierce advocate for freedom of speech, she has consistently shown us how environmental issues are social issues that ultimately become matters of justice. Like her writing, she cannot be easily categorized. She has testified before Congress on women's health issues, been a guest at the White House. She's camped in the remote regions of Utah and the Alaska wilderness and worked as a barefoot artist in Rwanda. Known for her impassioned and lyrical prose, Terry Tempest Williams is the author of the environmental literature classic, Refuge, An Unnatural History of Family and Place. Her body of work includes An Unspoken Hunger, Stories from the Field, Desert Quartet, The Open Space of Democracy, When Women Were Birds, and Erosion, Essays of Undoing, a collection of wide-ranging essays that explore the many forms of erosion we face, of democracy, science, compassion, and trust. Her new book with photographer Fazal Sheikh is The Moon is Behind Us, the result of a friendship forged through art and the creator's shared desire to collaborate on issues larger than themselves in a world that is broken and beautiful. In 2019, Williams was given the Robert Kirsch Award, a lifetime achievement prize given to a writer with a substantial connection to the American West. And she was also elected as a member into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her writing has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, Orion Magazine, she is currently writer in residence at the Harvard Divinity School. Hers is a crucial voice for ecological consciousness and social change. Please join me in welcoming Terry Tempest Williams. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, it's wonderful to see you in the virtual world. It's been a long time. Good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure and privilege to join you in this honoring of the Penn Hemingway award for a debut novel in 2022. This celebration belongs to the finalists as well as the winner and the judges um, for, the, for the beautiful recognition of these works. It's wonderful to be here virtually, each of us in our own place of residency, and one day we will be together physically. Congratulations to all the writers. And I'm so grateful to Penn America for all the ways you support us as writers and to the Hemingway Foundation and Society for the rigor and vibrant studies and scholarship that is yours. And I'm grateful to Liz Murphy and the JFK Library. I'm speaking to you from Cambridge along the Charles River, not so far from the Kennedy Library. These are the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts people, the original inhabitants of this place where this ground remains sacred to the Massachusetts and Wampanoag people. As I said, we're here to honor the Hemingway Award winner and the finalists, Burnt Sugar, Dear Miss Metropolitan, The Love Stories of W, <coughs> excuse me, E.B. Dubois, and The Five Wounds, our powerful books, spirited books, books born out of this moment. And congratulations to you, Tori Peters, uh, for the power and beauty of Detransition Baby. It's worth repeating its sharp wit, devastating clarity, and keenly observed characters. Exceptional, noted the judge's citation, not only for its fluid, intelligent prose, but also for the way the novel challenges dominant narratives of time and gender. 
that flatten and erase the rich complexity of the lives of both cis and trans people, unquote. I loved this novel and was transfixed, transported and transformed by Peter's bold prose, this human story and radically fresh window into the lives of trans people and how the nature of family can and must be reimagined. I honestly was turned inside out, upside down and redirected by the genderful prose by a writer who wrote with the freedom when there is no one there to correct us. Tori Peters, liberation as writer, a truth teller, became our liberation as informed readers. Quote, you are a languid boy who learned to move like a woman, who then learned to move like a boy again, but without wiping your hard drive each time, Reese observes of Ames. You got all these glitches in the way you move, you slither, end quote. This passage immediately took me to Ernest Hemingway's 1946 unpublished 200,000 word manuscript known as The Garden of Eden that he worked on for over 15 years. This text resides in the Kennedy Library's Hemingway archives. And I had the privilege of reading this 2000 page manuscript many years ago when I was working on a book called Leap about watching a painting, Hieronymus Bosch's triptych the Garden of Earthly Delights. I knew Hemingway visited the Prado often, and I knew he was transfixed with Bosch's triptych. So when I learned of this manuscript called The Garden of Eden, I suspected Bosch and his painting must appear in those pages, and they do. Scribner's, as you know, published posthumously a radically truncated version of this novel edited by Tom Jenks in 1986 it was reduced from 200,000 words to 70,000 words. And instead of highlighting the evocative storyline of a gender bending genre breaking text, Jenks chose to keep intact the unsurprising narrative of Hemingway's hypermasculinity, bypassing the braided and nuanced narrative of androgyny. This was not only unfaithful to the spirit of what Hemingway was exploring at least this is my view as a writer, not as a scholar. It felt like a literary crime committed in the name of fostering and furthering the myth of a writer instead of the movement of a man, exploring and experimenting with gender as fluid, not fixed. The Garden of Eden chronicles an extended moment in the lives of David Bourne, an American writer and his artist wife, Catherine, whose restlessness leads her to explore and transplant traditional sexual practices for, quote, transgressive ones, unquote. Suzanne Del Guizzo and Frederick J. Svobode, I can't pronounce this, Svobode, Svobode, in their book, The Garden of Eden, 25 Years of Criticism, right, and my apologies. Quote, they write, the Garden of Eden in the 2000 page version versus Scribner's 200 page posthumous book is far more overt in its activities of unorthodox sexual and gender roles as for example, when Catherine after cutting her hair renames herself as Peter in bed and suggests some alternative sexual activities to David whom she renames Catherine or when David and Catherine's menage expands to include a second woman in an initially bisexual relationship that eventually supplants the original marriage." Unquote. Nancy R. Comley and Robert Scholz write in their book, Hemingway's Genders, quote, what the unfinished text of the Garden of Eden is about as we understand it, is the relationship between a search for artistic truth and a sexuality that transgresses the norms of the culture Hemingway was trying to outgrow though it is not so visible in the sanitized version that Scribner approved for publication, sexual transgressions in thought and deed become the keys that unlock the artist's sources of information and allows them that glimpse of truth. As Joseph Conrad reminds us, that the public forgets to ask and neglects, neglects to notice when the gift is offered. Ernest Hemingway offered us a gift one that we may be just beginning to appreciate in its entirety. 
Yale Doctorow argues that the Garden of Eden is an act of artistic bravery. We know these kinds of erotic games were part of Hemingway's own life in his intimate relations and marriages. We see it in his story, Sea Change, as Sean Hemingway today noted in that stirring passage that he read. We know through Gertrude Stein that he struggled with his sexual identity, that he was a solitaire as much as he was the public persona that he did much to create. To be a writer is to court contradictions and be plagued with paradoxes. We write in the name of community, but in order to create community, we're pulled out of community, pulled into the depths of our own solitude. And it is terrifying at times. Its companion is conflict, a gnawing at the soul that cannot be ignored. We are engaged, there are no rules, there are no maps. We live with the discomfort and ambiguity of our own authority. At times it's lonely, often informed by pain. On other occasions, it is the body submerged in a phosphorescent tide, every movement sparking a trail of illumination. Afterwards, we sit on the shore in moonlight. No candles are necessary. Spirituality exists only when we are present. A writer must be present, buoyed up by the waters of attention. We learn the courage of faith. It is a peace that is earned. We can take solace in the heat of doubt, knowing this is the pulse of poetry. The pulse of bodies together is poetry. Our body and the body of earth, no separation. We are in creation. What we as writers know every single day. It has always struck me as a writer and lover of the American West who has felt, I have felt, a quiet yet keen kinship with Hemingway and his affection for the natural world in all its manifestations. That his work was less about what it means to be a man and more about what it means to be a human being that dares to touch the pulse of things, that dares to touch that which cannot be named or categorized, the spirituality of a body engaged. Neither man nor woman, masculine or feminine, but a body attuned to wildness in all its splendor, ardor, and complexities, intertwined, interrelated, and present to what is authentic, natural, and true, without boundaries, without borders, without judgment, where infinite possibilities lie with an ecological integrity in beauty and in terror, like the land itself, and across species, Diversity equals stability. The most alive place in any ecosystem is on the edges. Call it an ecotone. Like these, the edge of a forest and a meadow. The edge of a river and its bank. The waves licking the grasses in the dunes. Liminal spaces, in between spaces. Peters is an ecotone writer dissolving the hard lines. Hemingway is an ecotone writer, walking the edges. We read, we eat words as sacrament. For Hemingway's relationship to nature, even our own, especially our own, is complicated, paradoxical, and above all, erotic. Ernest Hemingway reminds me that we are not conquerors of nature, but rather that we are lovers. Our body, the body of earth, contains multitudes, and it is full as we are of contradictions and dichotomies, violent and tender. We hunt, we kill, we consume, we are nourished, we love our life, we loathe our life. It is physical and spiritual at once. We are mentored by life and death and confounded by both. It is the source of our words. The French deconstructionist and writer, Helena Sixou, has said in her book, Three Steps Up the Ladder of Writing, the only book worth writing is the book that threatens to kill us. 
Hemingway's unpublished manuscript on gender fluidity and androgyny alongside Tori Peters' Detransition Baby are books that surely must have threatened to kill their authors. They are full of risk and vulnerability and of fierce intelligence and bravery. And to quote the musician Maggie Rogers, Feral Joy, they are books that threaten to kill us as writers and readers because they are not only asking us to die to the old ways of being, but to embrace a new way of becoming, to free our minds so our bodies can dance even as the world burns. In 1996, some 26 years ago, I had the privilege, and at times I must say discomfort, of staying at the Hemingway House in Ketchum, Idaho. By chance, I just found this journal entry, July 24th, 1996. I could find no matches in Hemingway's house. No, wait, there is one in an empty match case. I lit, rather struck the match stick on a stone at the base of the fireplace. It lit, I held the candle to the flame, the flame went out. I had to light the candles by way of the stove. Finally, two candles were burning. Court Conley is staying with me. We try to listen to Hemingway's voice on the record where he is giving his Nobel Literature Prize the speech from Cuba. The record is turning. It is audible, but it is not understandable. We run upstairs where the speakers are. Evidently, he and Mary listen to music in their bedroom. Mumblings, more mumblings, audio scratches. We cannot translate what Hemingway is saying. Back downstairs, we have our ears close to the revolving black disc at 35 RPMs. We recognize low frequencies and the strength of his cadence. The needle is dull, I say to court. We need a new needle. We need to find a new needle, diamond sharp, to hear Hemingway's voice. Dr. Sean Hemingway, Dr. Colette Hemingway, and to the Hemingway family and trustees of the Hemingway Foundation, archive and estate, we need a new needle to hear what Ernest Hemingway is saying to us today. In the way that Tori Peters has complicated and illuminated our understanding of transgender lives, I ask you as a writer, I urge you, exhort you to release Ernest Hemingway, one of America's greatest writers, from the perpetuating myth of toxic masculinity. He was so much more. And allow the full body of his unfinished explorations in the Garden of Eden, in its entirety, to be heard, to be seen and read, held in our hands as a book of questions, imperfect and whole in this moment of transition, that the borders and boundaries that we have prescribed to him in life and in death be lifted. It is time that his words can become a breathing space, a wild place where we are inspired to be our highest and deepest, most authentic, fearless selves in the path and paths that are ours. The living can free the dead through our own evolution. Call it evolutionary courage. Our literary ancestors, Ernest Hemingway among them, are asking us to hear them differently. The book you have chosen to honor in 2022 as the Penn Hemingway Award for a debut novel, Detransition Baby by Tori Peters, a brave and gifted writer, is leading the way toward this path of liberation. This is why we write. This is how we write. This is how we write ourselves alive toward change. This is the leadership of the page. Liberation is our prayer. Congratulations, Tori, to all the finalists. Thank you.
Thank you for that thought-provoking and inspiring address, Terry. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us virtually to celebrate these marvelous writers and all they have done to enrich the world. Be well, and we wish you a good afternoon.